welcome. I'm Holly George Warren, and we are the Woodstock Masters Series, an event of the Birdcliff Forum, a project of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild in Woodstock, New York. Very, very excited today to have a wonderful conversation between the fabulous artist Heather Hutchison and the fantastic art writer and critic Eleanor Hartney. For the record, this is a Zoom broadcast happening on Monday, September 14th at 5 p.m. All comments you will hear made by the speakers or viewers are on their own and do not reflect the opinions of Birdcliff or its staff or volunteers. Our presentation today is expected to last about 50 minutes or so. There will be a Q&A period toward the end, and I will look for your comments in the chat section. I'll be able to select from there and hopefully get to as many of them as possible and get a response from our speakers today. You may give your name if you wish. That's your call. Um, and just to let you know, we are recording and archiving this event, and it will be posted to the Birdcliff YouTube channel. I'm going to kick things off by introducing our wonderful interviewer, um, Eleanor Hartney, and then I will turn it over to her and she will be introducing Heather Hutchison. So some great things to know about Eleanor. She is a contributing editor to Art in America and Art Press and has written extensively on contemporary art issues from many publications. Her books include Critical Condition, American Culture at the Crossroads, Postmodernism, Defending Complexity, Art Politics and the New World Order, Postmodern Heretics, The Catholic Imagination in Contemporary Art, Art and Today, and Doomsday Dreams, The Apocalyptic Imagination in Contemporary Art. Eleanor is a co-author of After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art, and The Reckoning, Women Artists of the New Millennium. She, re she received the College Art Association's Frank Jewett Mather Award for Distinction in Art Criticism in 1992, and was honored by the French government as a Chevalier dans l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres in 2008. Hartney is a past president of AICA USA, the American section of the International Art Critics Association. Welcome, Eleanor. I turn it over to you. All right. All right. Thank you, Holly. And, and um, thank you, Bert. Um, and thank you, everyone who is making this possible. I, I now have the distinct honor to introduce Heather Hutchison, who is our honored Woodstock master of the day. And I've known of her work for 30 years. And in fact, um, back in 1990, I, I remember walking into a gallery and seeing this kind of amazing kind of work, which, you know, it was this sort of mix of, of, of minimalism and, and light. And, and as I put it in the review that I wrote of this show, a, a mix of minimalism and metaphor. Um, the work was very, very impressive to me, and I described it thus, um, that Hutchison creates work that suggests, at times, Albers dematerialized, Nolan etched on water, or a marriage of Robert Irwin and Frank Stella. And what interested me in the work at the time, and continues to interest me, is this intriguing dance between the spiritual and the material in her work. And I think that's one of the things we'll probably talk about today. Um, Heather has been, has had an amazing uh, and peripatetic life, which perhaps she will tell us a little bit about. Um, but she's in, in, after really traveling, doing many different things, she settled in Woodstock in 2001. And that has remained her home base uh, ever since. She, her work has appeared in shows internationally, but she's also been very active in the Woodstock scene. Locally, she serves on the exhibition committee of the Birdcliff Colony. Um, and she was from 2005 and to 2016 was a member of the advisory committee. During that time, she curated six exhibitions mounted at Birdcliff's Kleinert James Center for the Arts in Woodstock. So Heather, it's, it's great to have a chance to talk to you yet again. And, and let's begin with 
How did you get to Woodstock? Let's, let's hear a little bit about that kind of amazing journey that, that got you here. Well, it wasn't far from Brooklyn, but, <laughs> but, but thank you, Eleanor. I'm really happy to be here. And that, uh, yeah, that review was so important to me. It was, uh, I was 26 years old and I'd never had a real review in an art magazine. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a real, a, you know, you told me what I was doing, which was really nice. <laughs> I appreciate that. But um, we, actually, we actually bought this house up here in um, 1997, and we moved up full time with our son in 2001. But we bought this house after um, looking around we were looking at lots of places in Brooklyn, like Carroll Gardens, and we were looking at whole buildings, you know, like, and we didn't have any money and we didn't have any, <laughs> we were both artists. And, uh, and we kept, we, we did everything we could to try and buy something, but it just, it just really wasn't happening. And it seemed very daunting to be landlords and, and own a whole building anyway. I don't know why we weren't looking at apartments. But uh, Mark was working at MTV at the time. And um, I had, I had taken a, I just decided that it's like we just all these realtors were really pressuring us to buy these four hundred thousand dollar four floor buildings in Cobble Hill. You know, it was like it was a lot of pressure. And so I came up and I and I, I just decided one day to not go to the studio and I drove up the Hudson River and I took a turn. I took a, I took nine and I took a turn at uh, Socrates. And uh, I went into a real estate office and there was this really nice lady and she just gave me a bunch of listings and a map. I drove and I drove around and I drove up. I ended up up at the monastery through Woodstock up at the monastery. And there, there, I was reminded of this dream that I had had in which I woke from this dream where I, and I was completely at peace and complete, completely at home. And I drove down the hill and I call Mark at work at MTV. And he's like, where are you? I said, I'm in Woodstock, your new home. And like two weeks later, I looked around and I saw, I was like, I, didn't, I hadn't even really thought of having a child yet or anything. I thought, I was like, oh, well, that person could be my babysitter. I could be that person's <laughs> babysitter. You know, it was like, it was just, and, and uh, so two weeks late, we really did actually buy this house two weeks later and we've been here ever since and uh, raised our son here. And uh, yeah, it's been really lovely. It's been really wow. Lovely. And, and we'll talk in a bit about, you know, whether Woodstock and this area has been, to the extent to which it's been an inspiration on the work, but I know you've prepared kind of a, a little um, sort of slideshow um, of the work. And so maybe one that sort of goes through it um, chronologically. So let's take a look at that. And then we can talk about as it goes through, sort of talk about some of the, you know, kind of developments in your career. So this is, uh, this is from that show that you, uh, that you reviewed, and I purposely put it in for that. And the title of it is Washington in Water. And it's solely because that was where I was living in Dumbo was the corner of Washington and water. And um, a lot of the work, I, I, was, I was playing with fluidity, like um, water, sky, these things that moved and I wanted them to be able to move in the paintings. And in these very formal compositions in this exhibition, I was pairing them with things that, that didn't move, that were still. And so this was, uh, I figured out how to get concrete on the masonite. Um, I was using like glue and, and uh, I, I, I just wrecked the hell out of my hands because concrete is very uh, caustic. But, um, and then I was using like a lot of black wax in the other panels. A lot of the, that exhibition were these very formal diptychs. Now, uh, you know, my, looking at this work, you know, it, to me, even, you know, you were living in Brooklyn at the time, and yet, you know, this work still has this kind of nature sensibility that's become such a powerful aspect of your work. I mean, was that something that you were thinking about at the time? Well, I gotta say, I mean, I, I find nature wherever I am. I mean, the reason we left Dumbo and came up here wasn't like to go find nature. It was more to have, um, I, I foresaw that we eventually wouldn't be able to both afford studios unless we made all kinds of compromises with our lives. And, um, but the nature in Dumbo up until we left was really actually quite incredible. We had a beach, we had sunflowers growing. We had, and at that time when I was in Dumbo, that was when you couldn't get a cab to go down there and they were finding bo you know, bodies, the bodies in bags, but they were really actually finding bodies in bags. I mean, it was a real thing. And I couldn't get 
often couldn't get a cab to go down there uh, at night. And there was a lot of nature and the nature there was the river. I mean, I was right on the, this, at this point I had a studio right, right at Washington and, and water, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, and the, the bridge was right there. And uh, it was, you know, that, that Fulton Ferry Park was really just grass and we had beaches in it. You know, there was a, there was a lot of nature and, but really, in retrospect, these blue squares, which is what I started with in these works, this wasn't, you're, the review said that it was my first solo show. My first solo show was actually at Best Cutler in 1989. And at that time, I was, um, I was really looking for, I'd come from California, I'd come from Marin County, and I was looking for nature all over the place. So I, in retrospect, I think I started making these boxes of sky just for myself. Mm. Um, anyway. So, do you want to do the next? I don't yeah, know. Let's go, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, that's where that does that. That's what that's what's going on there. So this is um, this is the this was the Corcoran Biennial uh, in Washington D.C., which is a an exhibition that that was no longer because the Corcoran uh, Gallery of Art doesn't exist anymore. But uh, it was it was a it was a lovely biennial of painting, and. Um, that piece on the left was 17 feet high and uh, it's called Penis Envy. Um, and my father at the time was dying of <laughs> prostate cancer. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Do you have something to say? No, anyway, whoops. Anyway, so back to that last one. I'm not done yet. Anyway, just <laughs> so, um, so, I, so I made him the 17 foot high penis basically. Um, uh, he died like a week after the exhibition opened. In the back you've got layers, uh, there was, um, what's her name? Oh my God, who's in there? Uh, Jessica Stockholder, Fred Tomaselli was in that exhibition. How many, how many works did you have in the show? Just the penis envy or were there more than that? That blue piece there is mine as well. That's called Monument. And I had, I had another two pieces in there. I shared a room with uh, Meryl Wagner, mm -hmm. Robert Ryman's widow, widow and an, an amazing artist in her own right. Um, and uh, I actually went to the Corcoran and measured. I did that piece for them, for that wall, because uh, uh, Terry Sultan was the curator. And, uh, and she showed me you know, the space. And so I, I made that piece for that space, but um, but that, that that was a lovely thing to be in. That yeah, I mean that in a way that you know kind of focus on on a kind of minimalist abstract aesthetic at that time was a bit of an outlier, wasn't it? I mean, um, I mean that's what's sort of interesting that, that you know this this work that you've been doing all these years. I mean, it's sort of. I guess that aesthetic kind of goes in and out of fashion. You've remained constant, but did at, at the time, um, you know, in the, that was what, 95. Um, it was an interesting choice, I think, to do a Corcoran Biennial kind of focusing on abstraction in that way. Yeah, her, her, her overarch, overarching um, concept was uh, materiality in painting. So it wasn't necessarily, but things were pretty minimal. Like there's a Jody Lomberg in the back there, which is like a minimal painting, but made of knitted, knitted materials. Things were, things were very stripped down. It's true. It is. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I can't think of, um, you know, you get in your little, you get in your little niche in New York, you know? So as far as I'm concerned, everybody was doing minimalism, you know, because that was my, you know, that was my, that was my world where, where, I was surrounded by those artists, right? I mean, you just find your little, your little group of cells and go hang out with them. But, and you find the curators who, who can recognize it and, and understand it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many art worlds happening at the same time and so many, you know. So as far as an outlier, yeah, pro I mean, from, from a lot of things, yes, but, you know. All right, should we move on? Do you want the next slide? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so, so then, so I had these like, um, oh, so we bought the house up here, like pretty much right after the Corcoran Biennial. Um, and I think part of that was because my father had died and I'd kind of realized, uh, you know, I realized that time was passing and, um, and, and what do you really want? 
you know do you really want to be struggling in new york city to make it and 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 find peace or oh and we were also like spending tons of money on um supplements from gary Knoll. and i was like wait a minute why are we taking all these things to combat our environment why don't we just like change our environment you know so um so we did and so so that was so so then we buy this house in 97 and then we move and then we move up here full time uh pre 9-11 uh, and we, because we had been basically gentrified out of Dumbo, we'd been thrown out in the middle of the night by our landlord. We were all we were on all over the papers with our two-year-old and our Christmas tree. We were in the New York Times, and um, we were the first of 50 buildings that had been zoned commercial. The Giuliani was uh, had a, it was like it was like 50, it was like 150 buildings. There was a list, and we were one of the first to be thrown out. And we fought it, and the other people, the other buildings got to stay. Um, we got back in a little bit and back, but but we ended up just moving up here because it was just, it was a war zone. It was a total, it was not good. But anyway, this piece is from 2006, and uh, the title is Sea of Change. And this is, this piece is in response to Hurricane Katrina. This is, this is like when I start to begin to um, uh, actually consciously respond to and respond with some sort of message and you can't tell <laughs> the message is basically climate change on this but, but that's that's very interesting i mean because you know that there's you know the, the work is 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 beautiful and it's about you know light and it's time and you know um color but yeah there's always been a kind of underlying sort of environmental thread throughout the work and i mean it's interesting here you know back here you know in, in 2006 and and katrina and and sort of we've now had these sort of cascading disasters and i mean that seems to be something that you've been focusing on ever more yeah i mean i've always felt that i have a personal relationship with the natural world you know i'm not necessarily a spectator but very much uh a, a part of it you know and um and i think it's it's in everybody's we are all part of the nature of, of nature in in the in the way that we are part of the natural world and i i just don't i just can't see getting away from that personally you know um yeah and i've always had this thing with work with my work where i really I didn't want to enforce any neurosis, you know? I came from a family of caricaturists, uh, like, a, like a number of generations of caricaturists, where, you know, the whole thing was to find that one little thing that was wrong with somebody and blow it up. And I, I saw how, how it hurt people. And uh, I really, I, I didn't want to do that. And I also, when, before I came to New York, I had done this Ronald Reagan voodoo doll for the 1984 Democratic mm -hmm. Convention. And that got into the Smithsonian and it was really popular and I sold a lot of them. And I put like this pin in, in Reagan, like right on his colon and he'd gotten colon cancer. I'm not laughing at that, but I just like, I understood from, from very early on the power one can have with art. And I, and I, and I decided that I, I wanted it to be used for good. And I wanted people to feel, to feel good about, you know, about, the experience they were having when they were looking at my art, if they were to, you know, give it that time. So even, yeah, even in, in the midst of sort of apocalypse, yeah, we, we find beauty and we find, a, 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 yeah, some kind of solace in a way, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think we have to, <laughs> right? Or we don't go on. Yeah, especially now. You, you, I know you're going to show now that there's um, time has been a very important part of, of your work. And this is one of the, the things about your work that's um, it, it, it doesn't you don't get the full sense of it by just looking at an image on a screen um, because the work is it's layered. It responds to light and time and, and the environment. And um, I think you're going to show now something you know a, a, a kind of time lapse piece that you have but you might tell us a little bit also about that about how because you know looking at it on the screen we really don't get the full effect of what this work is okay so this is a one minute time lapse of a of a window installation that i actually did at the kleiner 
at Birdcliff, and I took, uh, you'll see the floral show up in a minute. And it's just, I did a, a lot of scrim fabric stretched and I put a bunch of different materials in there to get the opacity that I wanted and the translucency that I wanted. And I painted the wall like the blackest black. And Carla Smith was uh, the director at the time. She flipped out on me. And, um, and I was like, Carla, Carla, please just trust me. And she trusted me. And from then on, we had this really wonderful relationship of trust. But you can see the, the, the floor lighting up right there. Um, but uh, so uh, my friend, Dean Janoff, a friend of mine from the city who's a videographer, I had this idea that I wanted to do time-lapse and, and, um, and I wanted to do a 24 hour time-lapse. And this was, this, this was at, the, uh, at the equinox. So the day was the, 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 the same length as the night. And so, so Dean so sweetly, this is just a one minute clip, but it goes, it's a durational piece. And he so sweetly um, uh, filmed this for me and that started for me, then I started to learn, then I had to learn how to do it myself. And that started for me um, doing these window installations. It kind of got me out of the box um, uh, that you just spoke of. Those pieces do what they do because they're actually physically in a box, in a shadow box. But um, I had been, this, this idea, I'd been wanting to do this. I'd, when I was traveling in Italy in particular, I'd see these, uh, you know, you'd be in these museums with these stucco walls that were like two feet deep. Uh, and then you'd go to the window and, and the window would be set inside a two foot. And I was like, wow, what I could do with that space around the window, you know? And um, I always loved that, that window at the Kleiner. And whenever I curated anything, I made sure that window was open because it brought the nature in. And that time-lapse does that. Like those trees are outside, but they're coming in, you mm -hmm. know? And, yeah. uh, and people thought it was a video. They thought the actual installation was a video. But that actually, so I did, then I did an, an, uh, an installation using the existing columns at the Dorsky Museum. I was part of one of their annuals. And um, I did, oh, locally at, um, at Imogen Holloway in Saugerties, I did two window installations there with the same kind of idea. But, but this was important because, and another beautiful thing is I could have this like, what was that, a 20 foot piece? And then in the end, I just was left with this ball of fabric, you know, that I made Halloween costumes for the family out of, you know, we <laughs> wore togas that year. But, uh, but uh, I love that because cause big work can be extremely cumbersome, you know, and, and then you've got to take care of it. And it's, 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 a, whole, it's a whole very material thing. But, but that started this tradition of, of illustrating the work and also I, through time lapse. And I also shoot a lot of time lapse in nature um, that then informs my paintings, you know, in a very loose way. But but it does. And, and it's this idea that things are, you know, that the only constant is change. Right. Well, wait, I think the next image, um, it, let, let's just, uh, yeah, go that things are um, here, some of the, the smaller works, but even in the smaller works, I think you're, can you talk about how, how you incorporate some of these ideas into these sort of, these are not, you know, moving mm -hmm. images, but they still have, in a way, they kind of incorporate that as well. They sort of distill it. Human, uh, the ideas of, of, of time and, and, and um, change. Oh, my I'm sorry, I just got a note that my internet connection is unstable. Is that, can you not hear me? No, no, you're, it's, so, it's good so far. Okay, good. Um, yeah, time and change. And so then I was like, okay, so I've got the light moving through. So, so the reason that the light's not moving through these pieces is I've got that box in the way. So then if you show the next slide, I got rid of the box. I'd gone to a garage sale up here and I, and I found a plexiglass bender at a yard sale. And I started messing around with it. And are we gonna get the next slide? Do we have the next slide? Hello? What, do, wait, which one do you want? Uh, rising um, Tide? It's called Ben's number five. This is the next one in the sequence you gave me. Okay, so do you see a bunch of bent plexiglass? Because all I see is this time lapse still. No, no, we no. It's moved on. We we're seeing uh, it. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Sorry. That may be because of the. You may be having a problem with the thing feeding it to you. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna trust that you see that. I know what it looks like. Yeah. So um, uh, Sneha Capedia had just uh, taken over Woodstock Framing Gallery from Alice, and um, our children were in school together, and she asked me uh, to do her first show, 
And so I showed that's, that's an image of those pieces there. Um, so by bending the plexiglass and, and, I, and I figured out how to, I would cantilever it, I have to dig a route out the wall and dig the wall out. Uh, I was able to get those to just float. And, and then, then I felt the light could really move all the way around them. And so I did those, those for a while. I think that was a, that show at Woodstock Crime Gallery was 2011, but I started making those immediately after this in 2008. Yeah. So we're, I think we're moving on now to the, um, let's see, this is work from 2016. Um, okay. Yeah, the, uh, what I learned from the sky and then rising tide from 2019. What, what are we at? This, I think that's where we're at now. Um, I mean, one of the things that's amazing to me about your work is it's so, it's kind of mysterious, like, like a work like this. Again, a slide doesn't really do it justice. You know, this, this digital image doesn't do it justice because there's a kind of, it, it's kind of magical. It's like you've, you've captured light. You've actually literally captured light. And part of that has to do with a, a very interesting kind of process and, and technique and use of materials that you've developed so that these are paintings but not really paintings in any sort of conventional way. Do you want to talk a little bit about process? Sure yeah I don't know what you're looking at what is it what is it do you know? This one I think is rising tide is that, oh. what's, that what we're at now Judy? Okay okay so that the one before that was an exhibition I had at Winston Walker uh, and then this rising tide is I showed with uh, with Jen Dragon, our lovely Jen Dragon, who was our mutual friend, and um, that was uh, first shown in the sh exhibition I had that Jen organized at Eleven Jane Street, and the title was of that was in praise of shadows, and um, I'm trying to remember what that piece looks like. Was oh yeah 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 okay so so oh so here we go so I get back to the box so I'm like. It's not the box, it's the wax on the box because those, those ones previous, I don't know if we explained it, but those were beeswax on plexi, plexiglass. And, I, and when I made those, I made my own brushes. I, I build my own supports. I mean, my work starts when I go to the lumber yard and I go, I go to Woodstock Building Supply now and uh, I, I choose a grain of wood and I bring it home or I for now I can bring it home because now I have a wood shop. For years I would I would you know cajole friends into to to letting me um, use their table saw, but um, but the, those particular pieces that you're looking at right now that's so I was like I was like it's it's the beeswax it's too opaque so I started working a, on figuring out a new medium and I developed a new medium that um, that allows me to uh, it's just. It's, it's less opaque, it holds more color, it doesn't have that, um, the, the fogginess of the beeswax. And, and I was also having a hard time with the beeswax because beeswax gives off this thing called bloom, which is this light dust. And it does that when there are impurities in the wax. And there were so, due to environmental circumstances, I believe, there were so many impurities in the wax that it just kept giving off this white powder. And, you know, I mean, no collector wants a biological uh, process going on on their wall <laughs> with a piece they just bought, unless, you know, they've, they've bought into that concept and that's <laughs> going on. But um, so, so this was, so, so these works came shortly after, this exhibition came shortly after I developed this new material. And, um, and I started using more reflective services, like, like my pieces, like those ones that you saw before with the Winston Walker or these, I've got like all kinds of tapes and duct tapes and anything reflective I can find. Um, I mean, it's kind of more like a laboratory in here than a studio, you know? I mean, I, and, I, and I like making these things and building these things and fashioning brushes and, uh, uh, you know, just trying to figure out what I can make out of, out of what I have and how I can like, um, how I can like transmute almost like these materials into something. What? I think we've no lost. You're not. I think we've lost you for a minute here. About material. Oh. Um, yeah, we, we've kind of lost you for a second. Why don't we go to the next one? Oh, which is or, you the know, time um, lapse. But, but that's, that's very important.
Yeah, let, let's go to the next one, the time lapse, um, Ling. So we're, we're looking now at the time lapse at Ling. Um, now, Heather, I'm not sure what your, did we lose you all together? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but again, part of what I think this shows is the way that these works depend on, on light and they depend on movement. They're, they're, they're very alive. They're not like a conventional painting. Um, and, and they do have, you know, if you, do, even if, you know, Heather tells you how they're made, they, they remain, retain this kind of very mysterious quality because they, it, it's, it's, you, you're not quite sure where exactly the color resides because they're in these plexiglass boxes and, and there's a sort of reflective surfaces and, and so it, it, they feel kind of very ethereal and uh, dematerialized. And it's, it's really kind of, I think, unlike anything else I've seen. And you, you get a bit of a sense of it, I think, from this. Um, now, have we well, lost Heather altogether? I think we did. And I want to stop the screen share so I can see if she's in the waiting room. Okay, okay? very good. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she's here. She's inside one of her paintings. <laughs> <laughs> so it says that the... Oh, there she is. She's back. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now, now we hear you, yes. Okay, because yes. it said that the host had me muted. Well, you but got I lost and I didn't even see you, but now I will start the... Yeah. Uh, I'll start now. the screen share again. Yay. Oh, wow, you're in nature. <laughs> Hi, my new home. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. I'm sorry. So, yeah. um, so do you want to go? Just, yeah. Do you want to talk about this time lapse here? Sure. All my notes are in there. Um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, this is the same idea, you know, of this. So, so I guess, is this the first one we're showing of the paintings? So, yeah, I just, I want to illustrate because nobody's going to stand there for 24 hours and watch what happens to the painting. So I just want to illustrate all these different facets of, of the work, you know, sometimes they come out better than others. And um, I can only, I've got one wall I can shoot on. Um, and I, and I, and in the summer, you know, the sun is over there, so it doesn't hit it. But, uh, and sometimes I'll, sh I'll, I'll shoot time lapse uh, when they're installed in exhibitions. But um, for me, it's just because I, I don't know if it come, comes across this idea of, of change and flux in these works that I'm trying to get across. So, so this just this is just a tool that helps me, you know, to to illustrate that. Let, let's look at the next one. There's another time lapse now too. Can we get that next one in. Oh yeah, that one's called yeah. Strata Cumulus. This was also shown uh, with Jen Dragon, and it was also shown in New York. And and can you? Yeah, I mean, here we seem wow. to see again you know, a reflection of the surrounding world. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um, this one's like about, that's about five feet by four feet or so. And um, yeah, I was just, I was actually, I was just looking at how, you know, how clouds like get bigger and then they're big and then they get, so I was just looking at how clouds lay in the sky, you know, and how um, sometimes they do that, that, that classic Georgia O'Keeffe thing where they just go poop, 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 poop. And, um, and, and that's pretty much, this, this piece is called Strata Cumulus. Yeah. And um, those are the new, th that was, those are the new mediums. Right. And so let's, yeah, so we look at the next one, Inversion. Inversion. Oh yeah. So that's about, uh, God, I wish I had the dimensions on these. Do I have the dimensions on these? Anyway, that's like about, that's about four feet by three feet. And lately around here, I don't know if, well, when I did this piece last summer, there was a lot of inversion of like this fog that was floating above the cool air was coming down and floating above the warming ground, you know, and creating this kind of fog that's an inversion, a temperature inversion. And um, this piece was inspired by that. Yeah. And, and the next one, twilighting? Yeah, twilighting. Yeah, so um, yeah, that was just, so this exhibition that these were all in that I had in New York that was, cl that closed, it opened February 20th and it closed uh, March 13th. 
uh, due to COVID precautions. And I really racked my brain for a title for this exhibition. And I ended up naming it Midair. And um, at the time it was because everything just, at that time, so Jan December, January, February, everything felt so extremely untethered in this country in particular. And I felt like everything, we were just floating, <laughs> you know? And it really, and I mean, COVID has actually grounded us to a certain extent. But um, to look back, and when I was, I made a, a video walkthrough because the show closed and I was trying to figure out, you know, what to do then and um, how to have the show have some sort of life. And um, I was, I didn't say it, but uh, I mean, I, I thought it was kind of prescient, the midair. I mean, because I did really feel at that point that it was an airborne uh, pathogen, you know? But well, one thing that's interesting about uh, this piece, so many of the other works that we've looked at, you know, the colors have been natural, but this one really has a kind of unnatural color. And, 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 and I think a number of works from this period too, you know, they, they sort of reflect, I mean, they, these, these sort of reds and these, these colors that, well, if, I guess maybe they're natural, but they're not, it's not the sort of placid green and, and blue, you know, that, that there's a kind of sense of fire. Some of them, I think, you know, have were uh, actually directly um, kind of inspired by some of the environmental disasters that we've had. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that as, as the color palette here, which, because it, it, it feels very, it, it feels different. Yeah, it's, it's as you said, it's, it's, it's hyper real. And it's uh, and it's and it's amped up and and um, like the the first the 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 one I showed with the black on the bottom and the blue on top, that uh, that was also in response to images I was getting uh, in in the media, like the newspaper, magazine, news media, not like some medium, but um, that uh, uh, of Hurricane Katrina and and and. A lot of these are are off of um, are inspired by like strange cloud formations or hurricanes or tornadoes or like you mentioned the fires. Um, those images of the f I was I did a, a piece off of campfire. Um, I, w I had gone to boarding school up near where that took place, uh, up in the Feather River area of California, uh, Lake Tahoe area, and. Um, that was, I mean, it's just actually right now, I can't even look at those images of the fires that are going on right now. I, I read and I know where they are and it's just, fire is just so devastating. And here's one, here's one here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, that one I did when the Amazon was burning off of images. But um, uh, so, so my, I feel like these things, like, like about four years ago, uh, the sky became extremely intense. I personally feel like there's like nature is really just trying to get our attention, you know, and it's and it's screaming at us. And through these through these new materials, I'm I'm able to get much more strong and vivid colors um, that you know that hopefully portray that idea. Yeah. Well, the the next image that we have is is a is um, a post-COVID image. These were all pre-COVID. So how, how did that COVID impact on, on your ideas and your art making? Well, this is pretty much, this is still coming up. The time was COVID. I don't know, like I'm in here. It started, those were the, the, the fires in Australia. I was getting all those images from those that were really, really intense. You know, you get like that, that, that layer of smoke that just lies and then you get this, this incredible uh, eerie light that comes off of the flame, but then filtered through dust and through smoke. And um, yeah, this one is called Multitudes. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it was post COVID. Also what happened for me post COVID was I, I had another exhibition that was, that I was, was to open in Los Angeles at Louis Stern um, Gallery. Uh, it was supposed to open May 5th and I was like working and was doing this really big piece and it just and I was you know it was it was hard and it was cumbersome and as soon as the as soon as things locked down Woodstock building supply was still open I went and I got some much 
a, a smaller, uh, like a half inch birch ply, which has got a much smaller stage, smaller scale all together. And I started making these, these pieces actually, that are like, eight, that were just, I just decided to do the size of a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11. So they could be, uh, so they were just easy. And they were also something that I could, that I could share with people easily, that I could use for uh, benefits, that I could stick in the mail, you know, just, just, and, and they just were more, um, more personal and more immediate and, and not something that's just so huge and, and requires, uh, you know, art truckers and tons of bubble wrap. And, you know, I just, it just seemed important to get, to get more immediate. Do you, do you think that that experience will change the way that you work you know, when we're finally out of all this? Honestly, I, I'm much more interested right now in the conceptual, <laughs> you know, um, as, as for, I mean, I've, I've been redoing my archives, my, like I've been, and uh, organizing things, kind of getting things back from galleries, kind of with this idea of like, I don't, I don't know, know about making things. <laughs> you know, right now. I don't know how important making things is. I'm feeling much more of a call um, towards, uh, towards activism to a certain degree, wow. you know? Yeah. But I do lo love seeing art. And, you know, we went down to the Whitney uh, the other day and saw that Agnes Pelton show. And yeah. there's, you know, and every time I go and I see art, I'm like, oh God, but it is so important, you know? I mean, some of it. <laughs> is so important but as far as um yeah i don't know i'm i'm, I'm trying to figure that out I, I think i think yeah in a way all of us are kind of struggling with that too you know that you know the thing that we do which has always been important to us but and yet there's this urgency now uh, um you know about you know i hate to say it but it's this sort of apocalyptic sense that that seems to be descending on us and and so figuring out how do we reconcile who we are and what we're doing now, what we've always done with the urgencies that are with us. Um, there, I think we have one more image here, uh, Promenade in Green. Yes. You want to tell us a little bit about this one? Okay, so I missed your whole last, what you said. You said oh. apocalyptic <laughs> sense and then the whole world ended. Um, but I'm, I keep coming out here because I think I have a stronger signal. Um, okay, so this is me being in the woods, like I hadn't left for five months, and things started to go vertical. So it's kind of like my woods here. Uh, yeah, so things started to go vertical, and I was, everything was so, so green. This is probably like in July, uh, June, July, when everything was just like, it just gets so vibrant and green. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I can really like just feel the life forces in these, in these things, you know? You know, I, I feel, you know, I mean, having spent the summer up here, up, up in the Catskills as well, and, you know, there's, there's something so nurturing about it. Um, and yet, you know, we know that there's such horrific things happening, and yet somehow, yeah, nature, nature is, 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 a, is a comfort and a solace right now, and we hope it will continue to be, and that's what's sort of so frightening about um, climate change, because this, this place that we can retreat to, you know, that could disappear as well. Well, yeah. Well, what are humans without nature? I mean, think about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, like, what are we without? I mean, I think we take it for granted that we are, I, that, that, it, that it's here and that it exists. And I think we, we really forget that we are all like, it's, it's just that, that the earth is a very, it's just a bio, it's a very diverse uh, community. Of, of all these different organisms, you know, and we just happen to be one of them. You know, yeah. the fact that we can write about it and say that we're the best one doesn't really mean that we're the primary, uh, uh, the primary force and have the leading role, you know. Right. One of the things, your work is so much about, it's about a sense of beauty. And in, a way, in that way, it relates to the kind of landscape tradition and particularly, I mean, to me, I, I feel, you know, there's the whole kind of Hudson River School luminist, you know, tradition of, of, of painting and the importance of light and color and, you know, being here in the midst of all of that. Um, 
And, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, how, first of all, how much you feel that being in Woodstock has impacted your sense of beauty and whether sort of COVID also has impacted and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, do we change what we think of as beauty? I mean, there's a sort of sense of this all being so fragile now. I think it, it feels much more fragile you know, that the, the natural world feels much more fragile, the beauty of it. And I don't know if, if that's sort of become a part of your work as well. I think it's always been a part of my work, um, but, I, but I'm seeing around me, I'm seeing uh, people responding to nature. I mean, people are coming up here in droves, you know, uh, and in the city, people are in Central Park. I think people, we had this, this amazing opportunity in which everything just stopped, you know? And everybody just kind of had to stop and think about, do I need, I mean, I'm always thinking now, do I really have to go there? Do I really have to go to the store? You know, I think that's kind of a, an awesome thing. I mean, obviously there's been all kinds of, of grief and, and sorrow and, 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 and there's been some really devastating, uh, situations for people and and especially people who 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 are already struggling are, are struggling more but as far as as far as nature being appreciated i think nature is being appreciated much more than it ever was now and i'm not i mean i'm in the woods as you can see i'm not i love the hudson i go to the hudson as much as i can i think if i were on the hudson like living on the hudson I'd, it would be much more, I mean, I've taken down trees so I can see the sky more. I have plans to like, to build a lookout tower so I can see the sky more. I'm very much in, in the woods here. And um, I think what Woodstock did coming up here did do for me was allow me breadth. Like I, I was able to get more broad in my ideas. I also was able to, one of the main reasons I, we were up here was to raise our child. And for me, raising a child and being a mother had a profound impact uh, on, on me as an artist, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it continues to. But, you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? I mean, how did you feel? I, that? I said that, but I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I, can I interject with, we've gotten some really great comments. These are such beautiful comments that you guys are making. And it's kind of cool how you ended up outside <laughs> in the element that inspires your work. So once again, uh, serendipity worked out in our favor, I think. I just want to let you know a couple of comments that we've gotten um, from some of the people participating today, Heather. Um, one person uh, wrote, among the things that the work evokes for me are Rothko color meets minimalism, silk soji screens, looking at stained silk screen, screen stained from previous use, back wall of a spraying booth, backlit frosted glass boxes, all sensuously beautiful qualities was a comment. Another person uh, made a comment, love the works, curious about the longevity of the materials you use. Do the materials, you know, you mentioned the beeswax and some of your trial and error with the, you know, the dusting factor, but in general with your um, materials that you use, do they last a lifetime? Do they last 20 years? Um, any idea about that? So far so good. <laughs> so far so good I mean the my first beeswax pieces were done in 1988 um, there's work in the Brooklyn Museum that was done in 1990 and they're huge on conservation um, they wouldn't even accept the piece back then in 1990 until it went through all kinds of conservation trials oh really um, uh, you know it's a it's a tough one I mean it used to be I don't I think things have have I don't know. That's maybe one thing that the apocalypse and COVID has changed about art as far as like, does everything really need to last forever? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I do, I do my best. Mm -hmm. Beautiful work. Um, and then also, I was curious myself, since, you know, you've lived in different parts of the country, you know, Northern California, Arizona, and of course now the gorgeous Hudson Valley, but all three have very distinctive uh, natural beauty, uh, different from one another. I'm wondering if, did you take any elements of your former environments that are still part of you that sometimes surprise you and come out in your art, even though they're not in your immediate surroundings right now? 
Oh yeah, and I've and I've made uh, I've made pilgrimage pilgrimages back to those places that were important to me, like the Oregon coast or uh, Bisbee, Arizona, or the Sonoran Desert in Arizona, um, San Francisco Bay Area. I go back regularly, and I do time lapses in nature, so I so I ca capture it, and I also do um, do these paintings where I just I work with watercolor in nature, and I just lay down. Uh, color relationships to each other and then I and then I use those this you know later or else they're just in my in my head mm -hmm. you know as far as um but but those no they're they're definitely they're definitely in there and you know landscape I mean landscape is pretty much any landscape painting is is pretty much uh composed of memory mm. <laughs> true <laughs> And even with the time lapse idea too, um, the other question that was, you know, you mentioned being a mother and have, raising your child here, who's now, I happen to know, um, is now in his early 20s, and your whole idea of time lapse with, the, with your image, with your paintings, is in the back of your mind the time lapse of your child growing up and watching him grow before your eyes? Is there any connection there? It sounds like a nightmare, Holly. <laughs> Can you can you stop it when they're 21 or you have to watch them go until like 90 and die? <laughs> God, I hope not. No. <laughs> no, no, not really, but you know you know how that happens though. Yeah, it could be subconscious. Could okay, be. subconsciously. Yeah. You can, you can lie, when you lie on the couch and do your Jungian psych, psychiatric uh, therapy, you can talk about that. <laughs> bring it up. Well, I did want to mention a couple of the qu quick questions because we're going to have to wrap up in a second. But um, somebody wrote in that they're very excited about seeing your conceptual art. And uh, they're, they're wondering if there's a timeline when you might see some of the conceptual art. Oh, I don't know, but I'll let them know. Oh, OK. OK, cool. You know, I have this. Oh, I have this, Holly. I've got this. When I was cleaning out the archives, I came across like two extra boxes of this beautiful catalog it's really gorgeous that Nora Jaime did with this nice nice essay by Sue Scott is it okay I would like to just leave some at the Birdcliff shop and if anybody wanted one they could come get it is that okay is that weird um you know what I think I hope that will be okay we can um find out and, and let you know oh okay uh, we, right. we do have Carlin so, Vincent here who is the director of exhibitions and I'm sure she's connected to the shop so maybe she can type okay. an answer right. about that or whatever right. um but I I just want to thank you Heather so much and Eleanor so much for this very very engaging conversation today it was so fascinating and you know, Heather, I have known you for many years and I learned so much today. It's wonderful to hear you talk about your art and Eleanor, your questions were so perceptive and so intuitive. So thank you so much for that. I well, thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, it so was fun. <laughs> it's really fantastic. I want to throw out a, a few more thanks to some very important people who made today happen. Uh, my co-organizer, Doug Shear, who was uh, just so brilliant at organizing these and has great ideas thanks to him our wonderful zoom operator judy kerman who did a great job and got those images up there and kept us all on board again the aforementioned carlin benson our wonderful birdcliff director of exhibitions and i want to thank all those people who tuned in today um, I do know that right now everybody is a bit strapped, but um, the same goes with bird cliffs. So if you are enjoying our free programs, please consider making a donation to the Woodstock Bird Cliff Guild on their website, which is woodstockguild.org. It would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And Heather, um, thank you for your offer of dropping these um, things that you found off that will entice people in, I hope, too. Yeah, yeah. So, Everyone, just have a wonderful rest of your day as we watch nature evolve now in the fall. We'll be thinking of you, Heather, and wonder how this is going to manifest in your art. And uh, it's wonderful to see everybody out there. Stay tuned for future uh, Zoom presentations from the Birdcliff Guild. And thank you all for joining us today. And have a great I night. I really appreciate everything and everybody showing up and Eleanor and Doug and Holly and Judy and Birdcliff, thank you so much. Okay, bye everybody, have a great night.